Let's welcome the first speaker, Benjamin. Okay. Welcome. All right. Um, hello. My name is Ben Steenhook. Um, I'm, I'll be presenting an empirical study of deep learning models for vulnerability detection. And I did this work with my wonderful co-authors at Iowa State University. Uh, first of all, um, why did we do this study? Well, deep learning has reported high performance on the vulnerability detection task. And it can even outperform static analysis tools. However, we don't have a very thorough understanding of these models, such as what are their limitations and um, how can we improve these models. To this end, we studied six research questions um, in order to better understand these models in uh, different settings and training data. We address the vulnerability detection task where given a function level of source code, we make a binary classification, either um, vulnerable or non-vulnerable. On the left are the nine vulnerability data or, um, models that we used to, in this study. And on the right are the two data sets which we studied in the different research questions. Uh, these data sets are made of open source C and C++ programs. And um, the, there's the MSR data set, which is made from CVEs or publicly sourced bug reports. And the Devine data set, uh, which is um, done by comment filtering and manual checking. For the first research question, we asked do models agree on the vulnerability detection results? And what are the variabilities across different runs of a model and across different models? Uh, to answer the first part of the question, uh, first of all, we can see that um, here that um, this table shows um, over three random seeds of training on the Devine data set. This table shows how many data or what percentage of data set examples uh, had the same prediction from all three random seeds. And we can see here on the, the red circle that um, in, in the worst cases, um, up to 50% of the examples are predicted differently across different random seats. And this can um, affect the quality of the evaluation and should be, um, should, should be accounted for. Um, second of all, we studied um, the agreement across different models. And we found that although models learn different diverse classifiers um, in the top row, uh, they also um, had similar predictions um, in similar model architectures. For the second research question, we asked, are certain types of vulnerabilities easier to detect? And should we build models for each type of vulnerability? Or should we build one model for all types of vulnerabilities? And to answer this, we split the MSR data set into five vulnerability types uh, based on the root causes of the bugs involved. And we trained models on each vulnerability type and on the combination of all vulnerability types. This plot shows the performances of the um, deep learning models in different settings. Um, each group of bars shows the performance of one model trained on each bug type. And each bar shows the performance when the model is evaluated on the same bug type that it was trained. Furthermore, the dots uh, above the bars show the cross bug type performance when the model is evaluated on a different type of bug. So for an example, on the far left, the Devine model um, in the blue bar shows that um, when the Devine model is trained on buffer overflow bugs and evaluated on buffer overflow bugs, it earns about 35 F1 score. And when evaluated on value errors in purple, it earns about 21 F1 score. A couple observations we can make. Um, for the first part of the question, uh, we can see that some bug, bug types, um, uh, the models performed relatively well on certain bug types, such as buffer overflows and value errors in blue and purple and performed relatively poorly on input validation and resource errors. Um, and these are in orange and red. And we can see this by the height of the bars uh, marked. To answer the second part of the question, uh, we can see that in some cases, uh, in, for most models, uh, the cross bug type performance is lower than the same bug type performance. And this is highlighted um, in blue, where the uh, dots are lower than the bars. However, the models, when trained on all bug types, often performed higher than the same bug type performance. And this is one surprising um, result of our, our study. This indicates that in our setting, focused training on one bug type was not better than training uh, the models on all bug types. And of course, this is the, uh, the other information highlighted in red. For the next research question, we studied, are programs with certain code features harder for the models to predict correctly? And if so, what are those code features? 
Uh, to study this question, first we measured the frequencies of some code features in the, in the programs um, that are given to the model, such as if statements, pointers, and the length of the program. And second of all, we trained a logistic regression model to predict whether the deep neural network was correct based on the features. Um, third, we took the logistic regression model's coefficients and we interpreted them to understand each feature's effects on the deep neural network's correctness. Um, and another term we can use for this is the difficulty of the example. To validate our approach, we selected examples from the Devine test set, which were most difficult in blue and most easy in green, as estimated by the logistic regression model. As we can see, for all models, um, the blue bars were actually lower than the green bars, um, showing that the logistic regression model was able to distinguish easy and difficult examples. Building on this study, uh, we, sh we now interpret the coefficients of the logistic regression model in order to understand the impact of each feature. This plot shows the coefficients of the logistic regression model for each co code feature listed on the x-axis. For example, arrays and go-to statements and um, all the other features which we counted. And on the y-axis, it represents the coefficient value uh, or, or the, the absolute value of this coefficient in the logistic regression model. A higher coefficient value implies that the feature um, was easier in our interpretation of the logistic regression model. Uh, lots of observations we can make, but a few here are, um, in, in, as highlighted in green, some features were um, considered easy by the logistic regression model, such as arrays and switch statements. Some features were neutral or didn't have much effect on the difficulty, such as pointers and the length of the program. And finally, some features were um, difficult for the logistic regression model, such as um, if statements, um, where all coefficient values are negative. Again, this indicates that um, a, a negative coefficient value indicates that a higher um, count of the feature um, tends to make the, the deep neural network model predict more incorrectly. For the next research question, we asked, can increasing the data set size help improve model performance for vulnerability detection? We trained the models with data sets of decreasing size uh, using the entire data set at the 100% on the far right and then um, using decreasing size uh, as the plot goes farther left. Um, and at each step, we measured the model's performance on a single held out test set. We found that um, performance increased with more data, but most models earned near 100% performance with only a small fraction of the data around one to 2,000 vulnerable examples as highlighted on the plot. Beyond this turning point, performance did not incre significantly increase with more data. For the next research question, we asked, how does the project composition in the training data set affect the performance of the models? Uh, first of all, we confirmed an earlier finding um, in finding one that all models performed worse on projects that were not seen in the training set. Um, to, to dig deeper into the study, we asked also what's the effect of the project diversity in the training data set. And in order to study this sub-question, uh, we first prepared a non-diverse training data set with one project, uh, the, the, the largest project in our data set, the Chrome browser, and a diverse training set with 50.6 projects on average. Um, and our finding from, um, from, and we evaluated uh, both of these training set, uh, models trained on both of these training data sets on the same held out test set of unseen projects. Um, so our finding, um, as shown in this plot, is that most models generalized from the non-diverse training data set, um, just Chrome, better than the diverse uh, training data set. And this indicates that uh, diversity is um, not the only property that we would care about in, uh, to generalize to um, novel projects. For our final research question, we studied the source code features that the models used for predictions by using explanation tools to compute the top 10 most important lines in each program. Uh, we compared the important lines from each model um, uh, between models, and we also looked at which features showed up the most frequently in these important sets. And a couple findings we can see, although I'll skip the details for sake of time. Um, the first finding is that models agreed on three to six lines out of 10, uh, which is a large proportion um, of the important feature set. And um, finding two is that the models use some features such as error and printf, uh, which are not directly um, causing bugs. Uh, more frequently than some important features such as for statements, if statements, um, memory allocations, and copies. And this surprising finding um, motivates some research into 
um, why these models focused on the, the features um, and uh, how to make them focus on the, the uh, features that are important for bugs. So I'll just sum up some key findings of our work. First of all, um, the models varied on up to 50% of data set examples and different models predictions were often not in agreement. Uh, most models reached a good performance um, at one to 2,000 vulnerable examples, um, almost on par with uh, the whole data set um, that was available. We found that all bug types, uh, training with all bug types can perform better, although um, not in all cases and from all models. Um, some features were difficult, such as if statements, and um, some, some features such as the length of programs or pointers were not difficult. Um, models performed worse on unseen projects, and training on one project in our setting um, performed better than training on uh, many projects uh, for unseen projects. And finally, the models focused on some features such as error and print more frequently than some other uh, notable features such as if statements and mem copy. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and I'll be glad to take any questions now or after the talk. Thanks for the talk. Any question? First, excellent talk. So um, one question, I'll go all the way back to the beginning, and you talked about these types of models outperform static analysis tools. And I was wondering if you can explain that more. Sure. Um, so this is not an evaluation that we did directly, um, but um, some, some earlier work, I, th I think the work is called SYSEVR, has evaluated their model against um, some popular open source static analyzers and found that in terms of precision, recall, and F1 score, um, their deep learning model can perform better than the static analyzer. Um, so that, that work is a little bit early. And then um, we study some state-of-the-art models that build on top of that work. Okay, just a follow-on. I mean, I know it's not your work now, so I'm just, I'll sure. just make a comment that when I've seen things like that, so a static analysis tool might have a higher false positive, but it finds like 500 or 200. Uh -huh. And a lot of the papers I read about this approach find 12 or 15 um, that with a high precision. And so I don't know how the false negatives, the missing things are evaluated in, in any of those papers, but it seems before people say outperform static analysis, they should, you know, understand, like, you know. Yeah, it, it does need to be qualified, it's yeah. true. We evaluated precision and recall, and indeed uh, both are important, yeah. Right. Okay, okay any other Uh, just curious, for the logistic regression, uh, what was the input for it? Was it a TF-IDF or Edbert embedding or some sort of embedding, global embedding? Yeah, um, so the input to the logistic regression model was actually the count of each code feature um, in the program. So for example, if a program had five four statements in it, then the, count, the, the feature for that um, coefficient would be a five. Yeah. Thank you for the question. question. Any other question? Okay, I have one question. Sure. Uh, so, uh, in your RQ2, uh, you show the figure. Uh, I'm uh, curious about, uh, are the bugs only trend, trend on one type of vulnerabilities and then test on the other, on the other uh, types, or so they are trained together and then test on one of them? Yeah, I'm um, sure. I kind of breezed over it for the sake of time, but um, yeah, to answer your question, um, the brown bar shows the model that was trained on all types of vulnerabilities oh, and see. evaluated on a separate held out set of um, uh, unseen bug types. Okay. And the other five colored bars show um, the models trained on one type of vulnerability and evaluated on another. I see, I see. So thank you for the question. Okay. Well, thanks for your talk. So let's, well, let's thank the author again and welcome to the next thank one. You. Okay, hey, everyone. Uh, this is Ashish. I'm a PhD student under Dr. Tian Wen at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, unfortunately, Wenbo couldn't be here today, but um, I'll try to take and answer your questions to the best of my abilities. Uh, to give you a background, I mean, we are in the vulnerability detection session, so <laughs> vulnerability detection is the task of uh, analyzing a given code example uh, to predict whether if it's vulnerable or not, that is it possesses any form of software vulnerabilities. 
And uh, recent advances in machine learning and deep learning has prompted a surge in applying these techniques for uh, automated vulnerability detection. However, uh, this study actually found four key issues with the existing approaches. The first being data imbalance. I mean, thankfully, uh, non-vulnerable code is much more frequent than a vulnerable one, but then that's not very efficient for training such models. And um, this data duplication that is, there has been uh, data corruption where uh, there's repetition of samples across the training and uh, test splits. Um, the innate adequacy of the models used, wherein a lot of them actually you treat code as a sequence of tokens, but uh, do not consider the semantic dependencies between them. Uh, while these issues can actually be resolved by you know, tweaking the training process and uh, by a model design, uh, what we specifically focus on is this issue where they learn irrelevant features. And for this purpose, we um, come up with what we call class separation features and identify such features. Uh, for example, let's look at this code change where, uh, which essentially resolves a denial of service bug uh, stemming from an uncontrolled memory allocation the EXIV2 project. This was eventually fixed by actually adding the underlying uh, condition there. And uh, essentially what was happening is uh, because we were not, uh, they were, the authors were not originally checking for subbox.lent to be zero, uh, it was resulting in integer overflow and uh, as a result of that, uh, the execution flow to the exception point in line seven was incorrectly constructed. And uh, we can actually observe a data dependency from statements three to six, and then also a control dependency from statements six to seven. Uh, in general, uh, considering these dependencies between the statements, the idea we had was uh, to be able to detect an improper execution exception or error handling case, uh, one needs to examine both the data and control dependencies among the program elements that are involved with the exception flow specifically. Um, and the general idea is that um, studying such exception flow will help detect the potential vulnerability better. <laughs> Next, uh, we present a CV entry for uh, improper access control in JFinal. Uh, which allows the remote attackers to obtain sensitive information and execute arbitrary code via this rename function. Uh, this is mainly because there's a missing flow from the variable new file to the variable file2 on line 11. Highlighted are several exit points here defined with this dot error, but then actually none of them uh, check for the validity of the new file name. This further shows that a model can examine the flows from the variables to the exception, exception handling points for vulnerability detection. Uh, taking this, uh, these observations into consideration uh, and specifically focusing on improving class separability, uh, we highlight key features that we consider for our approach, the first being exception flow graphs, uh, which, in, which is expected to consist the key program elements uh, and the dependencies pertaining to the vulnerabilities. Uh, next, we look at the post-dominator tree. Uh, the general idea is that um, the EFG does not uh, consider the regular flow, which the PDT does. Um, consider the uh, vulnerable code snippet from earlier and its corresponding combination of the EFG and PDT. Uh, we can see that um, for the post-dominator edge from statement four to statement three, Essentially what's happening is statement four is considered to be the post dominator of statement three. If uh, all the paths to the exit point of the method, that's statement seven, uh, starting at statement three, go through statement four. Also, we can see that the exception flow for this graph is S3 to S6 to S7. And then uh, the PDT is of the form uh, S10 to S9 all the way till S3. Um, if you see, if you assume that S6 does not have the correct condition in the if statement, as is the case here, uh, via the EFG, we can see that the execution will actually never reach S7. But then from the PDT, we know that all statements to S6 must go via S9 and S10. Thus, an incorrect execution of S6 could lead to the incorrect result or crash at either S9 or S10. So we believe these two features help uh, catch such exceptions and learn from such features. 
Uh, previous works have uh, shown that vulnerable code occurs at statements with specific syntactic types. And analogous to the parse of speech tags in natural language, we also consider the statement types. And then we also consider the long part to mainly capture the syntactic structure and then the caller quality relations to capture the global context. And using these uh, specific features, we uh, construct embeddings for each of them and finally combine them uh, with using a fully connected layer to get a central embedding based on which we actually predict whether there's a vulnerability or not in the given code, uh, method. Um, next, com coming to the empirical evaluation, we actually compared our tool with the other state-of-the-art deep learning based vulnerability detection approaches. Overall, we can see that uh, our tool relatively improves over the baseline models in the range of 13 to around 29.6% in precision and so and so in recall and F-score. Next, if you actually look at uh, this particular code snippet, uh, this is actually a vulnerable code example from OpenSSL. Um, the baseline tools, uh, that is Reveal and IV Detect, uh, they were actually not able to identify this as uh, vulnerable, whereas our tool was able to. And uh, when we tried to break it down as to why this is happening, one of the reasons was that, A, to begin with, this code example is actually pretty big. Uh, it has 186 lines of code. That is after removing the comments and then the empty lines. Uh, also, if you build the PDG, it has about 145 nodes and 477 edges. And the code property graph, it, it has about 622 nodes and 1393 edges. In contrast with relatively less number of nodes and edges, uh, our tool was able to actually predict the vulnerability in this code example. And then uh, we also specifically looked at the five most popular types of vulnerabilities and how our tool performs on uh, these uh, vulnerability types. And then uh, we saw that uh, for actually from among these not shown, uh, sorry, from among these for execute code specifically, we saw that uh, 58 per, uh, we have a relatively lower F score of 58%. And uh, in general, we realize that DPD does not handle well uh, the vulnerabilities that involve string literals, overflow, or underflow, and memory consumption because it does not cons uh, cons consider the execution values in its current design. But then, if say you look at den den denial of service, uh, it actually has a high uh, performance there. Uh, there are also other experiments in the paper where we look at the contributions of different features and uh, we do an ablation on top of it uh, to see how they contribute towards the uh, performance improvement. Uh, please do refer to the paper for those details as well. Um, in conclusion, we started with, uh, we presented an extensive set, uh, experiment set observing DPD's performance improvements, advantage over the other baseline shortcomings and contributions of the hypothesized class separation features specifically for vulnerability detection. And in this regard, uh, we started with our, the motivation to actually explore such class separation features instead of just relying on a large or larger language model today <laughs> uh, to identify them by themselves. And uh, next we moved on to our um, motivation to see that looking at specific features like for example, EFG actually helped uh, identify specific types of bugs better. Uh, next, we also introduced uh, the different features that we used, and uh, hopefully um, we can also identify many other such features which specifically helps identifying those kinds of bugs, like the execution-based, which uh, we don't do as well right now. And then also we showed the uh, exper uh, exper experiments that we uh, performed and then the performance of our tool on, uh, as compared to the other baselines. Uh, that's all from me. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hi. Thank you for the great word and presentation. Uh, can you elaborate on denial of service? Uh, because we may have denial of service via segmentation fault, check failure, for example, 
heap of overflow crash. What actually denial of service here means uh, in your uh, here? Yeah, denial of service. Yeah. Uh, from my understanding, it's a popular uh, CWE, uh, CV category, and uh, all of the bugs are actually classified in this, in these categories. Mm -hmm. But then um, that's my understanding of this work. Okay, it's uh, mentioned in CVE, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Thanks for your presentation. I have a question about your architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed that you use a lot of uh, models architecture, such as Trio STM, label GCN and GRU, etc. So why you use such different labels, uh, different models to encode the uh, graph or the text? Um, like I actually mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, it's ideal if you have a lot of data. Yeah. If it's ideal if you have a lot of data for all categories of bugs. And then given that that's not the case, and uh, because otherwise, I, uh, what one would assume is with a large, sufficiently large model, we can possibly capture all of the features which we hope to do. But then if that's not possible, then we have to rely on these class separation features that we stress on, which is, uh, which is how uh, we combine with these different components here. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, just the focus was on the features. Any other question? Okay, uh, I have one maybe strict question. Yeah. I saw the architecture is very similar to the architecture in every detect, you know, mm -hmm. the architecture. So I'm not sure whether the features here are uh, appropriate for class separability uh, in one big detection. So what's the motivation of such design? Um, the motivation in general, like again, going back to the empirical study that was performed, Okay. where uh, they observed that even though uh, it was actually uh, IB Detect was using PDGs and uh, ASTs, okay. uh, so um, through those specific program representations, there was just a lot of noise in the data. So that's the reason why, or that was the motivation for us to spec specifically look for the subset of the features, where in limited amount of data, we can learn the information that we should. And that actually, none of the experiments we do by comparing our performance specifically with IV Detect for different, um, different uh, specific set of features and how we do better with or without those features as opposed to IV Detect. I see. So uh, why do not compare with more advanced baselines such as Lanval? I saw you use the, the fun data yes. set, right? Yeah. <laughs> Why not compare with Lanvo? Uh, so actually, this uh, data set we collected uh, on top of the fan data set, because um, I think fan was limited until the 2020, and we okay. uh, collected more, because we use oh, the, the color quality relations. By yourself. Sorry? The data set is collected by yourself? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. I see. And then um, after um, using the tool for calling relations and uh, the other features, um, it came down to about 21,000 samples. And uh, I think that was underrepresentative of uh, what the tool or the data set it was used in uh, line well. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, let's thank you to Ashish again. Thank you. Okay. Features of source code. Uh, there are different kinds of approaches, like text or token based approaches use text form input, like source code or intermediate representation, and tree based approaches generate abstract syntax tree to train the model, and the graph based approaches usually use program dependency graph to retain control flow and data flow information for better performance. Uh, however, there are still problems in existing works. Uh, all these models are good at synthetic datasets, but poor at real-world datasets, 
which means detecting real-world with complex, uh, real-world code with complex logic and semantics is still a challenge. We found that existing works, semantic extraction works to neural networks, and uh, they usually select a representation of source code and then train the model with the vulnerable code 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 takes only a small part of the function, and uh, there are many irrelevant code where affect the learning and de detection of models. Besides, existing models do not know the connections of functions. Different functions can share similar patterns, such as similar logic, similar algorithms, or similar subtypes. Uh, and there are similar bugs exist in different functions. If we can figure out the connections of functions, uh, we can use this, use this information to make similar bugs being detected more efficiently. And let's look at an example. Uh, there are exact same bugs in same in following functions. Uh, both functions use an implicit type conversion to cast the size t variable named the size underscore to an int type the variable size. And the variable size is the used in the name code below. And in a 64-bit system, this cast will truncate the size t variable and uh, there might be an integer sign overflow uh, if the variable is big enough. And finally, it will lead to a buffer flow in the main copy. We could see that the both function and the both bugs share the, the same logic and the lines are almost the same. But when we look, but when we look at the whole functions, there are differences in confused baby models. First, the function scale differs. And the first one is 284 lines, which is much bigger than the second one. But the vulnerable part takes only less than 10 lines, and it is rather small. Many approaches use slicing to figure out the vulnerable part, but even if we have bug location, the slice may be incomplete or redundant. Uh, usually, the bug location is generated by dipping the vulnerable version with the bug fixed version, and the default result is like this. And the such bug location does make sense. But if we slice out this line, the result would be 167 lines and 103 lines, and it is much bigger than the vulnerable path. So to solve that, the problem, we try to break functions apart and build a graph to start functions' behaviors. Instead of trying to get the exact slice of the bug, we break the function apart and use slices of operations that are prone to be vulnerable to represent behavior of function. And function could be treated as a set of behaviors that work together to implement a certain functionality. And the vulnerability could exist in one behavior or a set of behaviors. And uh, here are some slices of API call and memory operation on previous two functions. And we can see that the first two slices are vulnerable and they are high, highly similar. And others are some the other slices that are irrelevant to the vulnerability. Then we try to build a graph. We can calculate similarities of behaviors and connect the function to build the graph. Uh, for example, the two functions are connected to the class and main copy behavior. If we try to detect the new coming N2K receive function, we can find it also has the class and main copy behavior. And its connection to these two vulnerable functions indicates that it is also overly vulnerable. Our motivation is to extract vulner vulnerable semantics and filter irre irrelevant codes, and also to address underlying connections between functions to make similar marks being detected more easily. And our idea is constructing a behavior graph to leverage connections between functions. We propose a behavior graph to have vulnerability detection. There are two types of the nodes in the graph, a function node and behavior nodes. And if a function possesses a behavior, then there will be an edge between the function and the behavior node. And there is an example. And these are non-vulnerable functions. And these are vulnerable functions. And there are some behaviors. Sorry. Uh, with behavior graph, we can describe the connections of functions by shared behavior. For instance, these two functions share these two functions share behavior too, and their connections could be addressed by these two edges. And we can also highlight potentially vulnerable behavior in the graph. For instance, 
behavior three and four uh, connect to two, two vulnerable functions, and they are more likely to have high risk semantics. And behavior two connects to two non vulnerable functions, and they are less like and it is less likely to contain some vulnerable semantics. We design OBG to utilize our proposed behavior graph model to enhance deep learning based VD systems. We first construct the graph and then extract a feature in the graph. And we uh, combine our feature with other model feature to make the classification. The overall process of behavior graph construction is this. There are real major steps like slicing for behaviors and embedding and clustering to calculate similarities and graph construction. Uh, in our system, we use slices operations that are prone to be vulnerable to represent behavior or functions. This helps filter out codes that are unlikely to be vulnerable. We are primarily concerned with two types of operations, uh, memory operation and API call operation. Memory operation includes error indexing, pointer in reference, and the field access, which would make a read or write to memory. And for this type of operation, we conduct backward slice on the pointer like variable. And for API call operation, we do backward slice on its parameters and forward slice on its return value. And uh, we implement our slicing using PDG generated by drone. Uh, we try to find depth of variable in backward size and try to find the use of variable in forward size. And if the variable exists in control flow structure, we also, uh, like the if statement, we also uh, conclude, include the if statement in our slice. And uh, with the behaviors, we can try to build the graph. Uh, by computing similarities, we can find similar behavior, but calculating the similarity for each pair of behaviors will make the problem too complex and there will be too much nodes in the graph. Uh, here, we use clustering to reduce the complexity. We first embed slices using converts and then use k-means to get centroid behavior, and uh, each centroid behavior is then used to represent a category of behaviors. We also calculate the Euclidean distance between behavior and its centroid behavior to address their differences. With this, in with this information, we can build the graph now. Uh, we can connect functions to centroid behavior nodes and set the weights on the edges using the distance. For instance, F1 possesses B1 and B2, and their corresponding centroid behavior is CB1 and CB3. Then there would be edges between F1 and CB1, and between F1 and CB3 and we set the age to the distance between B1 and CB1 and the distance between B2 and CB3. Now we've got the behavior graph and we need to extract the behavior feature for classification and fusion. We use node 2 get to get vector representation of function nodes in a graph uh, and we know node 2 get uh, applies BS random walk and then use what to back to embed the traces of the work to get the vector. For the training process, not to back, uh, we directly apply not to back on function nodes. And for the testing process, we made a slight modification to handle new nodes. We add the new nodes to BG and apply random work on it. And then we update the vocabulary of what to back to get the new vector. To make classification, we use a simple MRP with four linear layers to do the binary classification task. And this is the process of testing. We still use slicing to get behaviors, and then use prediction of timings to get new ages, and then we use updating of not to back to get behavior from new behavior feature. And uh, this is the fusion step. What we aim at enhancing other model's performance, and uh, we just uh, simply concat the last hidden layer of the previous MMRP. And, uh, uh, concat is with another model's class hideness output and add an output layer for prediction. We evaluate our work on two real world dataset, FFmpeg and Cumul, which is balanced and it is part of the divine dataset, and Chrome and Divine dataset, which is very imbalanced. We use rebalancing to, uh, we use oversampling to rebalance the dataset. And the metric we use is precision recall and F1 score. We make comparison with XCNN, SGRU, Bloomberg, Divine, and Boston. Uh, the first part is the performance of BG. We use several methods to determine the k, k means and uh, the result is like this. 
and the performance of the models is shown on the table. On the balanced data set, behavior graph uh, ranks first in the F1 and recall, but its precision is not very high. And on the other data set, uh, behavior graph ranks, ranks second in F1, and it also looks at a high recall. We think the reason of the high recall but a relatively low precision is that uh, we can find more similar bugs by the connection between functions, but some non-vulnerable some non -vulnerable functions share a similar behavior with vulnerable one, and the resulting are false positive. And there, an, another reason is that there is no code detail in the graph, since we use the clustering to construct the graph. And the next part is the performance of fusion models. As shown in the table, all models get improved, and the average improvement on different metrics are listed here. And this is a precision uh, there's a precision drop in the fusion of taxi index because the taxi baseline has the highest precision, and the fusion may make the precision being averaged. And also, there is a report drop in the fusion model of code birds, but code birds. Uh, charges almost uh, all samples to be vulnerable on the imbalanced data set, and the drop is reasonable. Finally, we can make the conclusion we propose a novel approach that can extract functions' behavior and then construct a behavior graph to represent connections of functions, and we implement a framework for BG. Okay, any question to ask the author? Hi, thank you for the great work and the presentation. Uh, my question is that by the behavior graph, you mean that uh, the graph models runtime behavior of the source code or system under test? Do you hear me? Uh, so, uh, the connection is lost. Uh, could you uh, by behavior graph, you mean the runtime behavior or just the semantic relation between code statements? Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Uh, thank you for the talk. So I'm interested in the behavior graph construction. I noticed that uh, you just uh, you only introduced the memory operation and the API call operation. So I was curious that uh, uh, do you also consider other other operation? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the author again for the talk. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Xing Cheng Wen. Uh, I'm a master student from Harbin Institute of Technology, Shenzhen. I'm really honored to be here to introduce our teamwork, vulnerability detection with graph simplification and enhanced graph representation learning. This paper is completed by authors from Harbin Institute of Technology, Shenzhen, Chongqing University, and King's College, London. And first, I will introduce the introduction and background of this paper. As we all know, uh, deep learning-based vulnerability de detection automatically learns the patterns of vulnerable code. Recently, graph-based methods are widely used in vulnerability detection, and these methods typically use code structure graph, such, uh, sub, such as AST, uh, control flow graph, uh, CFG, and, and data flow graph, and so on. And then these methods leverage GNN graph neural networks models to learn graph representations for vulnerability detections. 
However, these methods are still limited by the GNN, which are difficult to handle the connections between long distance nodes in a code structure graph. The long distance nodes problems is also called over, over smoothing problem in artificial intelligence. It means that the GNN models are difficult to capture the global information of the graph representation. And I will first introduce DIVI as an example to explain the over smoothing problem in vulnerability detection. DIVI, a widely used vulnerability detection method which combines the code structure graph and GNN to capture the vulnerability patterns. As the figure show, DIVI shows a better performance when, when, uh, with few nodes. The more the node numbers in a graph, the worse the performance of DIVI. It illustrates that the over smoothing problem have existed in previous graph-based methods. To elevate these problems, we propose AMPLE. Figure 2 is AMPLE's architecture. It contains two major parts, including the uh, graph simplification and enhanced graph representation learning. The graph simplification part aims at condensing the repetitive information in a code structure graph and reduce the distance between nodes by shrinking the size of graph. And we actually propose two types of uh, simplification steps, the type-based and variable-based graph simplification. Um, before to introduce the uh, graph simplification steps, uh, uh, we introduce uh, the each node in our code structure graph. It has two attributes, node type and node variable. The text in the boxes is the variable attribute, and the text under the boxes is the type attribute. And we will first introduce the type-based graph simpli uh, simplification. The type-based uh, graph simplification aims at merging nodes according, according to the node types. By using the parsing principles and manually checking, we have identified seven merging rules for type-based, as shown in table one. The merging rule corresponds to different types of statements, including expression statement, condition statement, uh, for in statements, and so on. For each pair of parent and child nodes matching one merging rule, the child node will be removed since its information is the refinement of parent node. Figure 3 is also a concrete example for rule 2. In the uh, upper subfigure, the information in the node with red border, forced milk ten is also covered by its parents node and is uh, satisfied by the rule two. So we merge it into its parents node. Another simplification method we propose is a variable based graph simplification, which aims at merging if loads uh, according to the node variables. The same variables may appear multiple times in one function. So the variable node with the same value can also be repeated in a code structure graph. Figure 4 is an example. The variable structure appears for two times, thereby we merge the two structure leaf nodes and it does not change the hierarchical parent-child information. Besides, since the merge node has more than one parent node, it can aggregate node information from different statements simultaneously. The second part of AMPO is enhanced graph representation learning, which involves one additional an uh, edge-aware graph convolutional network module and one kernel-scale representation module. The edge-aware graph convolutional network module aims at fusing heterogeneous edge information into node representations. We first in incorporate multiply edge information into node embeddings. For each edge type, we use a different edge way to represent it. Then we use the uh, propagation mechanism of the graph neural network and employ the different edge weights to update the node uh, representations. And finally, we use the attention and fit forward network to control how much different edge information contributes to the node representation. Uh, the edge aware graph neural networks module considers the information of edge types and fills the heterogeneous edge information into node representations. Then we will introduce the kernel scale representation module, which aims at capturing the relationship between distant graph nodes to evaluate over smoothing problem. It consists of a large kernel and a small kernel convolution. The large kernel convolution focuses on the relationship between distant nodes, and the small kernel focuses on the relationship between neighborhood nodes. Uh, finally, the convolutions with different kernel scales is conducted in parallel. It can simultaneously learn the global and local information from the graph. 
Next, I will introduce the evaluation and experience in this paper. Uh, in, in order to evaluate Ample, we explore these four research questions, including the effective of Ample and different components in Ample. We use the three evaluation datasets in C and C+, and we also compare the performance of Ample with six baselines, including three token-based methods and three graph-based methods. Uh, in RQ1, in we explore the effects of Ample. We observe, uh, we observe that the three graph-based methods, divide, review, and IV detect, show better performance than the three token-based methods in accuracy and F1. And the results also show that Ample outperforms all the baseline methods on the three datasets. And we believe that Ample reduce the graph size and capture more global information to improve the performance. In RQ2, we explore the ex uh, effective of graph simpl simplification part, which consists of two steps, the contribution and rate of the graph simpl simplification. First, we perform um, an ablation uh, study. We compare the performance of four versions of Ample. Uh, we start graph, graph simplification. We call it the graph original. With only type-based, uh, we call it the graph uh, VGS. Uh, with only variable base, uh, we call it graph TGS, and with both uh, graph simplification methods. And we can find that both TGS and VGS outperform original, which proves that each simplification is effective. We also observe that the VGS slightly performs TGS, which indicates that the VGS contributes more to the graph representation learning than TGS. In the sec sec uh, second aspect, we analyze the size of the co-structure graph, including node distance. Uh, we also call the shortest length between two reachable nodes in a co-structure graph. And uh, simplification rate, we call the ratio of the reduced nodes or edges. Compared with the original code structure graph, the average node distance and max node distance drop obviously. We found that the TGS can reduce the code structure graph size to a great extent, which may be attributed to that the VGS only applies to the leaf nodes of code structure graph. In RQ3, we explore the impact of two modules in the enhanced graph representation learning on Ample, uh, including the, oh, it shows that the um, all components in enhanced graph representation, uh, representation learning are beneficial to the performance. To further explore the effects of the, uh, we propose the EAGCM module, we, repla we replace the module with other existing GN models, including the GCN, GGN, RG RGCN, and compare them with Ample. Our proposed methods, EAGCM performs better than the existing GN models. In RQ4, is the inference of uh, hyperparents on Ample. We explore the effect of different hyperparents, uh, such as mentioned before, the size of the convolutional kernel, um, uh, and the EAG sense layers, and so on. Uh, so to summarize, we have the following kind of conclusion for our work. The existing GNN-based vulnerability detection methods tend to fail to capture global information of cost structure graph, we, we also means the over semantic problem. To solve this problem, this paper proposed Ample, a novel vulnerability detection framework with graph simplification and enhanced graph repre representation learning. Our source co code datasets and four experimental results are uh, uh, available at following GitHub links. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Any question? Yeah. Uh, if not, uh, I have one question. And so, uh, in during the graph simplification, you use seven uh, rows, seven rows. So, how to choose these seven rows, and uh, what about the other rows? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, in this paper, we propose seven uh, rules about um, about the type-based graph simplification. Uh, it, uh, uh, it it based it the, the uh, our used uh, tool stream and our manual checking. Uh, uh, we we focus on the repeat, uh, repetitive information of code structure graph, and and uh, this is uh, 
what, uh, what we do to uh, shrink the noise size in a code structure graph. Okay, any question? Okay, uh, another question is that in the uh, ample you proposed, uh, you use uh, P PDG graph, right? Uh, code structure uh, graph. Code graph, how about uh, uh, the other graphs on the, such as AST? Okay, the, um, uh, the code structure graph is include uh, the AST, uh, DFG, CFG, and NCS. Uh, if, we if we want to uh, shrink the node size in AST, it can also do that. Okay, okay. Uh, let's thank the author again and uh, <laughs> thanks, Xin Cheng. Okay, uh, and move to the next speaker. Okay, um, <clears throat> hello everyone. My name is Yang Xu. And uh, it's my honor to be here to present our work, Does Data Sampling Improve Deep Learning Based Vulnerability Detection? Yes and yes. This work is done by me and Professor Wang Shaowei from University of Manitoba, and Dr. Li Yi and Professor Wang Shaohua from New Jersey Institute of Technology. First, let's talk about our motivations. Okay. Recent progress in deep learning has sparked researchers' interest in using it to detect software vulnerability automatically, and it has been demonstrated with promising results. However, one prominent and practical issue for vulnerability detection is data imbalance. Previous study observed that the performance of the state-of-the-art deep learning-based vulnerability detection drops, uh, drops in real-world imbalance data by almost 73%. Such a significant performance drop can disable the practical usage of any vulnerability detection approach. Deep learning uh, data sampling is effective in elevating data imbalance for machine learning model, and it has been demonstrated in various other software engineering tasks. Therefore, in this work, we aim to assess the impact of data sampling on the effectiveness of existing SOTA DLVD approaches and their ability of learning vulnerable patterns. For this purpose, we designed two research questions. Does data sampling improve the effectiveness of existing DLVD approaches? And does data sampling improve the ability of DLVD for learning the vulnerable patterns? And then we designed the experiment pipeline of our study. In general, DLVD approaches in the green rectangle consist of three phrases. Feature extraction, model chaining, and model deployment. First, in the feature extraction phase, semantic and static properties of code will be extracted. And then the extracted feature are transformed into a real value vectors by representation learning. And then a binary classification model is used to perform vulnerability detection. For the DLVD models we test in our study, we select three graph-based model, divine, reveal, and IV detect and one token based model, line phone. Also, we test data sampling in two aspects. First, we perform data sampling in raw data, which include random oversampling and random undersampling. We will note them as RUS underscore R and RUS underscore R, which R represent raw. And then we also perform data sampling in later latent space, which include random oversampling, random undersampling one-sided selection and mode. Same as before, we will note them with a underscore L, which L represents latent space. And then let's discuss our RQ1. In order to answer the RQ1, we apply various data sampling approaches to the SOTA DLVD models and compare them with the one without sampling. To be more specifically, we examine the performance on six sampling methods, also with the no sampling as a baseline reference. And then we test them in all four DLVD models in three popular vulnerability detection data sets. And then we use the mean performance from 20 random split for a more consistency result. This table here is the average ranking of each data sampling approaches on all DLVD models and vulnerability detection data sets in terms of different evaluation metrics. So a lower number here means a better performance. By comparing the sampling on raw data and the sampling on latent space, we can see that in general, sampling on raw data outperform 
the sampling on raw, on, on latent space. And also, by comparing our sampling method and under sampling method, we noticed that in general, over sampling outperformed under sampling. However, random under sampling performed the best in improving recall. Also, we find that the most simple approaches, random over sampling on raw data, outperform all other study sampling approaches. Okay, now after we know that, yes, data sampling can improve the effectiveness of existing DLVD approaches, we also wanted to know does it improve the ability of DLVD for learning the vulnerable patterns? In order to answer that, we leverage some explainable AI tools, GNN Explainer and Lime. We select review model with GNN Explainer and test them on big world data set. This is because the big world data set have the information about the actual vulnerable lines. We can know that if the result of the explainable AI tools refer to the actual vulnerable line, or the model is just being lucky that it identify a vulnerable function from a non-vulnerable line of code. Similarly, we use explainable AI to line with line role model on a big data set. The figure shows the result of the explainable AI tools on all true positive results. And the number in the figure shows the ratio of successfully reasoning cases. A higher ratio is better. For the result, we find that in a significant portion of cases, even if the DLVD approaches correctly predict a vulnerable function, it cannot reason their prediction over real vulnerability statement. And then we notice that the random over sampling on raw data improved the ability of DLVD approaches for learning real vulnerable pattern. Does it mean that repeating might help? Therefore, we test to oversample the vulnerability class by two times and also four times. And then we find that oversampling by two times achieved the best performance in terms of reasoning and also F1 score. And oversampling by four times become lower again. Maybe this is because it introduced a new imbalance problem in another way. The above example present the line result of a vulnerable function before and after random oversampling on raw data. The function has a use after free vulnerability at line marked with green rectangle. Before random oversampling on raw data, line rows predicts it as a non-vulnerable according to the statement highlighted in the blue in the left. While after random oversampling on raw data, line row is able to predict correctly and really based on the vulnerable line highlighted in the orange on the right. The observation probably indicate that duplicated data points in the raw chaining data set are not necessarily just noise to the model. They could provide some positive influence on the model for learning the real pattern. And now we want to have a discuss. Why does raw data sampling perform better than latent space sampling? We have the assumption. We suspect that Sampling on raw data separate vulnerable class from non-vulnerable class better than sampling on latent space. By <coughs> in order to validate our assumption, we compare RSL and RSR on the data distribution in latent space. We use TSNE to visualize the distribution of these two class. We can see that from the TSNE graph, the ROS on raw separate the vulnerable case from the non-vulnerable case much better than the ROS on latent space. And then there are some implications for uh, <coughs> conducted from the previous finding. First, we recommend future practitioners to use oversampling over undersampling, sampling on raw data, over sampling on latent space. And then we recommend future practitioners to use random oversampling on raw data to handle data imbalance issue in deep learning vulnerability detection. And also we encourage future research de to develop new data augmentation technique to improve the ability of deep learning vulnerability detection approaches for learning real vulnerable patterns. That is all of uh, my presentation. Thank you everyone. If you are interested in the, our paper, you can scan the QR code on the screen. Thank you. Okay, thanks talk. We have many minutes for Q and A.
in RQ2, the experimental setting um, part, uh, we know that the IV detect also use the GN explainers to live uh, to nine level variable detection. Why not use it or you did it right with live wall? Yes, you, uh, in, in, in RQ2, you use, you use the uh, you use the uh, review model. Why why don't you use the uh, IV detect model? Because uh, the paper have uh, also used the GM explainer in it in IV detect paper. Oh, I, I know that. So, uh, sorry. Uh, why why don't you use the IV detect to uh, to do to to do, do this design? Uh, you choose the review model. Uh, I recall that uh, maybe because the uh, review runs a uh, little bit faster than IV detect, so to save some time, I just use review. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? So, um, uh, interesting study, but there are some other technologies maybe more recent. Uh, for example, instead of having one policy across all the data, at ICSI and some papers at TSC recently uh, looking at local regions of the data and adjusting the sampling policy per local region. Yeah? And uh, another technology is... Um, um, uh, SMOTE is not one thing. SMOTE is, uh, you know, parameters. And so hyperparameter optimization of SMOTE. And I'm sure many of your other things have got tweaks and numbers. Like, you've, you had a, a tweak number sample twice, yeah? Towards the end, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a number, you know. So I'm wondering what you think about uh, uh, the more recent stuff that um, has different policies for different regions of the data, and uh, other stuff that does hyperparameter optimization of the algorithms that you're looking at. Uh, you mean different policy for different distribution of the data? Well, you actually grid up the data. Like if if you go back to your uh, graph uh, at the end of the explanation. Um, where, where, where you explored your assumption. And yeah, now you can actually look at that graph and say, and do a little tiny local regions and say in these regions, it's not even worth doing sampling policy one. It's much more important to do sampling policy two. Yeah, but like uh, our raw data is cold, right? So in order to, uh, it needs to be uh, convert into vectors before it can be shown into the figures here. So uh, it's difficult to perform them on the raw data. Right, but you're already doing many of the analysis you need. Like, you know, you could literally do Markov chains on the, the AST of the leaf to work out similarities in regions. And, you know, so no, I, I, I don't think it's a, an intractable problem to uh, say, okay. you know, different regions get different sampling methods. Okay, thank you for your advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Any other question? We still have four minutes for Q and A. Uh, thank you for the talk. Interesting work. So um, for the vulnerability, there's also a different type of vulnerability, right? So I was wondering that do you have any insight on? Uh, is it necessary also to conduct the sampling, uh, like stratify some sampling according to different type of vulnerability? Yeah, uh, I think that's very interesting. But that's the problem is that so if we also consider sampling on different type of vulnerability, like the ratio between non-vulnerable and vulnerable is already very large. And then if we further separate from the vulnerable into different sub um, type of vulnerable, and then we try to upsample them and and then I, I, I think the, the calculation resource will require a lot. Yeah, uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, um, I do perfectly agree with uh, what Tim said. I just wanted to add something else uh, about the hyperparameter. Uh, did you thought about some uh, auto um, uh, sorry, uh, some algorithms how to tune your hyperparameters because as Tim said, there are a lot of numbers and a lot of things that can be tricked uh, to improve your performances. Uh, did you try uh, to run uh, is a uh, uh, future works uh, or you maybe didn't take uh, into assumption to use uh, automatic auto auto hyperparameter tuning tuning? Sorry. Oh, you mean Thank the hyperparameters for data sampling? Yeah. 
Uh, we we didn't consider that. But uh, Uh, for the other data, yeah. for the DLV data approaches, yeah. uh, we use what their paper use. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't try to. Yeah, I didn't try to tweak okay. their hyperparameter yet. Okay, it's very interesting that you find that the raw data sampling performs better the sampling from Latin space, right? So, uh, what's the reason behind? It's because the vector size. I mean the. Uh, the raw data during the raw data sampling, the vector size may be smaller or larger than that from the latent space. Uh, my assumption is that um, while we still doing the sampling on latent space, it is after the representation learning. So the imbalanced data may also lose information and like uh, causing the represent learning, the representation learning part a uh, little bit worse. And then uh, even after the represent representation learning, we perform the sampling. Uh, it might help with the classification model in the last, but the representation learning part is like uh, uh, still not good. That is my assumption. Uh, so uh, your conclusion encourages uh, future research to conduct data sampling during one big detection, like such kinds of tasks. Uh, on the raw data. On the raw data, right. Yes. Another question is that uh, during, during your experiments, you use the data size, right? Have you ever uh, compare or analyze the distribution of data size? Uh, is there, uh, for example, whether there is any relation between the distribution uh, and uh, the, the, re the results, the sampling, uh, the effect of the sampling? Uh, we didn't consider that. Oh, OK. Uh, okay, I think data sampling more uh, works on the imbalanced data size, right? Uh, the, sorry? Data sampling performs uh, more effectively on the imbalanced data size. That uh, is fun. Yes. Yes. Uh, for the one data size, maybe. Not. Yeah, for the divine data size, it's um, already almost naturally balanced. So it does not perform uh, better than others. Okay, okay, I see. I thank the author for the uh, excellent talk. Okay, let's move to the next speaker. Uh, First of all, thank you so much for coming to my talk, uh, provided the weather outside is magnificent and uh, it's a Friday evening as well. Um, my name is Ayush. Uh, if this presentation would have been a week before, I would have said I'm a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg. But since I defended last week, I do not know what to say today. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I guess I'm still in the transition, but nevertheless, uh, I'm a co-author of the paper, Learning from What We Know, How to Perform Vulnerability Prediction Using Noisy Historical Data. Our paper was published in Empirical Software Engineering Journal in 2022. Um, since I have limited time here today, I will like to keep it short. So uh, there exists few vulnerability prediction approaches in the literature, at least in 2020, 2021. Uh, I divided them into uh, two. Uh, on the left, we have uh, machine learning approaches where we have two manually defined features corresponding to the vulnerabilities for uh, training the models. And on the right, we have deep learning approaches where we have uh, the feature identification corresponding to the vulnerabilities is automatic. Uh, most of the deep learning uh, approaches uh, are based on uh, encoder-decoder architecture or transformers, but we also have graph neural network approaches as well. Uh, so we considered all these seven approaches as state-of-the-art, and we ask how effective are state-of-the-art approaches in predicting vulnerabilities. So for this study, we consider 36 releases of Linux kernel, 10 releases of Fireshark, and 10 releases of OpenSSL. We use the tool Valdata 7 that helped us to gather uh, uh, source code of these 56 releases, as well as their corresponding vulnerabilities. For the training and evaluation, we considered uh, release-based prediction, where we trained the, uh, the models of state-of-the-art on all the uh, files of one release. And then we tested the trained model on all the files of the next release, and so on and so forth. Well, 
unfortunately, and we were not expecting that. Uh, the performance of state of the art uh, was similar to random selection. And we know the reason why, at least we targeted it at uh, one part of the problem. This is because of noisy historical data. So let's say this is a timeline of a usual system release. After the first release, a developer uh, checks in a code which is vulnerable, unintentionally of course. And then after many releases later, usually this is the case, uh, they identified that there is a vulnerability in the system and a fix was introduced, a patch was introduced, then the fix propagated throughout the release. Now, the problem is that before this patch was introduced, the vulnerable files, uh, sorry, the non-vulnerable files, which were supposedly non-vulnerable, were actually vulnerable because it contained the vulnerability. And this encompasses noise. And when this noise is used to train the models, it affects their performance. So we thought to mitigate this, can we learn only from the things that we know? That, that means we try to reduce the noise whatsoever and we try to learn on the validated data. That means we have the patches with us. That means pairs of vulnerable and fixed files. Can we learn from that? And this is exactly what we did. So we learn on the patches. That means pairs of vulnerable and fixed files. And then we tested our trained models on all the files of the next release and so on and so forth. Since we were training on validated data, we named our approach as Trabone. Here we trained our encoder decoder architecture on the patches, that means the pairs of vulnerable and fixed files. Now, before providing the source code to encoder decoder architecture, we kind of make it easier for it to understand the code context by uh, reducing the vocabulary. We did it with the help of abstraction. So we abstracted the source code. We replaced human defined variable names with generic identifiers which are reusable throughout the data points. Now, we ask how effective is shown in comparison to state of the art. And we were surprised that we got thrice the results, thrice the performance as compared to state of the art when trained with validated data. And this helped us to conclude that Travon mitigated the problem of noisy historical data by training on validated data. In my conclusion, I would like to conclude that we emphasized on training on validated data. We proposed an approach to Travon that does so, and we achieved thrice the performance in comparison to state of the art by training on validated data. Now, this is just a glimpse of a large study that we conducted. Uh, here, I provide you with a QR code that you can scan that will lead you to our GitHub repo repository that contains the link to the paper, our source code, train model, uh, data set, as well as our implementation of state-of-the-art approaches, which was not avail publicly available before. And with that, uh, I thank you for your time, and I'll appreciate any questions, concerns that you have. Thank you. Any question? Thank you for the talk. It's a very practical problem here. Uh, I mean, the, the, the paper is solving a very practical problem. And I was curious that uh, how do you construct the validator data set? Because as you know, the, normally we use the, we know the vulnerability and know the fix, right? And normally we, we use the git brain to, to, to check the, the inducing code, but there's a problem, it will cause some inaccurate result, right? That's why we uh, have the SAZ or the VSAZ. Uh, and I was curious that uh, in your paper, how do you construct the validated data set? So I think I partially understood the question. I do not know about VSAZ that you say, uh, but about the, validated, the, about the validation set, we, uh, the release that we were uh, uh, training our model on, we divided it into 80 and 20. So 20% was the validation set and 80% was the training. I hope that answers. Oh, okay. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is a very, very short Q&A session. Yeah. Okay, let's send to the author. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's move to the last presentation. <clears throat> All right. So this paper is very different than the others. Um, and it's going to talk about a very large-scale vulnerability discovery effort. Um, the re lead researcher, Sarah Elder, my PhD student, was not able to make it. Um, there's an army of people, so many authors, and a lot of work that went into this. <clears throat> and let's see, why is it not? 
Okay, there we go. Um, so basically the problem that we're trying to address is there's lots of different ways to discover vulnerabilities in addition to all the ones we heard about today. Um, lots of different tools, lots of different techniques, and so we wanted to address the question of how do you, like from a practitioner standpoint in particular, how do you discover vulnerabilities? <clears throat> so um, the goal is to, to aid decision makers in making the choices of how to discover vulnerabilities um, and research questions are what is the effectiveness in terms of number and types of vulnerabilities for each technique, and I'll explain the techniques, and how does the report, what is the efficiency and vulnerabilities per hour of each of the techniques. So we examined four different techniques. Um, the first one is we call SMPT, Systematic Manual Penetration Testing. And this was using, you know, developing a test plan in order to discover vulnerabilities. Um, and we used as the basis for a systematic approach the um, OWASP ASVS application, um, I don't know, security vulnerability standard. Um, and it's a, you know, a standard that will take you through all of the different types of vulnerabilities and what you should do to test it. And we developed test cases to test using that. Developed 131 predetermined test cases before we ran them. Two, two different students ran them. PhD students ran them and then compared results. The next one is classical penetration testing. We call it exploratory manual penetration testing, um, which is classic penetration, you know, like opportunistic, I think I should try this kind of testing. Um, and that was done by 62 students in my graduate level class. Um, after a whole semester of learning how to discover vulnerabilities, um, they, their last assignment was for three hours to do a think out loud approach of going through the application and saying, oh, there's an input box, I think I'll put a SQL injection in there, and they kind of explored the applications. Um, so 62 students, three hours each did that. Um, and then the other two are more automated techniques, so DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, or fuzzing. Um, two different tools run by two different people comparing results in order to come up with true and false positives. Same with static analysis. Two different tools, two different people comparing results to come up with true and false positives. That was the first research question. The second is um, the students did report vulnerabilities per hour. Um, the system under test is OpenMRS, which is a very large, basically 4 million line um, Java application that is actually used in uh, real settings. So here's our results um, across the different techniques. And I offer all of you who are doing these uh, machine learning and deep learning to use our data set and test your techniques. Um, and so before I go through these results, I'll, I'll say that from this is a real application um, in NVD. There are seven report at the time we wrote this paper, seven reported vulnerabilities. We looked through the vulnerability data set of the application, the internal developer data set, we found 20 more. So externally reported vulnerabilities before we did this was 27. Um, left to right, well, so first is um, systematic manual penetration testing, predetermined. Um, and so what we did was report by the different OWASP top 10 categories and then the others that weren't mapped. So systematic manual penetration testing, found um, 32 total true positive vulnerabilities that were high severity, 37, so a few more that were lower. Um, manual, or like the exploratory type of penetration testing actually found the most. 165 higher severity, um, 185 with others. Fuzzing or, or DAS found the least, and static analysis also found a lot. Um, and if you look by type, you can see different Different OWASP category types had different results. So it's kind of like if broken access control, static analysis did best. Injection, um, exploratory did best. Um, if you look at the bottom line, it is the total found by one technique, not found by the other. So the students not only found true and false positive, they looked for different techniques finding the same vulnerability. So you can see on the bottom line, there was a lot of unique vulnerabilities found by each tool. So one technique was not enough in any case. This is reported efficiency across the techniques. Um, actually, the most efficient technique was penetration testing um, with 2.43 vulnerabilities per hour. The other techniques, you know, static analysis was next, and, um, and then the others were lower. 
So um, really what we came out with was manual penetration testing actually found the most um, and the efficiency was highest, which is not what we expected. We expected some kind of um, static analysis tool to, to do best. So that's our findings. Um, and again, I offer up anyone who wants to use our data set to see what your techniques will find compared to the other techniques. And I'll take questions now. Uh, any question? Uh, so, so. Uh, hi, thank you for the great work and uh, good talk. Um, I, I noticed that there's kind of like a lot of complementary um, exploits found by the manual. I guess like the big table that you showed. Yeah. On um, the bottom row, the like unique uh, mm -hmm. the exploits found. I wonder if um, did you. Did the students, I guess, the, the manual analyzers, have access to the dynamic and static tools? I, I no, imagine it might be helpful for they, um, they to didn't. combine them, maybe to. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's uh, true. No, they had to do it all manually. Oh, sure. I'm um, like, I think out loud. I'm going to try this, but oh, no, they okay. couldn't run tools while they were doing that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And and all of those are confirmed true positives. So if a student. Um, actually, you know, say they found something, then one of the researchers went and found it again. Any question? I would like just to hear your comment about the difference that you found between systematic manual testing and, you know, exploratory manual testing, because this seems like to suggest that systematic is not, you know, really useful. Yeah, no, I mean, we were surprised, I'll be honest. Um, if you look, and if you look across the categories, I mean, there were 11 found that were not found by any other technique. Um, the, the systematic, because the OWASP ASVS is very comprehensive, um, you know, it explored areas, all areas, and so we were surprised. I guess is what I'd say. Thank you. And I think that it, like with penetration testing, um, you find something and then you're like, aha, I found that. I bet I can do it here. Like, you know, and so you follow a path where systematic, you know, you, it, you, we develop those test cases before looking at anything. Thank you. Okay, like, let's thank our Laurie again okay. for the talk. <laughs> okay. uh, that's the end of our session. Thank everyone for attending.